Today, Bill, our Spicer Axle Specialist, and I will be taking a look at heavy-duty axle failure analysis. Heavy-duty axles and medium-duty axles fail in similar ways, and for the same reasons. The difference is that heavy-duty axles have power dividers, or inter-axle differentials. They can be affected, too. Like a medium-duty axle, the typical heavy-duty axle sees mile after mile of operation, year after year. And they're built to take that kind of steady use. What they can't take is repeated misuse. You mean like going off highway when you don't have that kind of vehicle? Well, that's certainly misuse. But what I'm getting at is the unintentional abuse that causes failure. Well, like what? Well, there are three main reasons why axles fail. First is overloading the axle. Excess cargo requires more torque. Repeatedly pushing the component beyond the torque range it's designed for is overloading. I see. The second main reason for axle failure is incorrect vehicle operation. Drivers who haven't had proper training can damage an axle even if it's right for the job and it's been maintained correctly. The third reason for axle failure is improper maintenance. If the axle hasn't been maintained regularly or if it hasn't been serviced correctly, it can fail. Well, I see why you say that a lot of axle failures result from not understanding the whole picture. That's right. I think looking at failed axle parts would help. Okay, why don't we go take a look? Fine. Wow, these parts are really in bad shape, Bill. Oh yeah, they're built rugged. But if you misuse them long enough, they eventually fail. So this group of parts failed because they were operated under a severe overload. Why are some of these parts cut up like this? Bob, these are actual failed parts, which we've cut up for metallurgical testing. Hmm. What causes overloading? Overload failures can happen instantly as a result of a sudden applied load, or axles can break down over a long period of time if they're continually operated beyond their design capabilities. Now, what failures are caused by overloading? Severe or repeated overloading causes three kinds of fatigue failures. Surface fatigue, bending fatigue, and torsional fatigue. Now, surface fatigue failures typically involve some loss of metal from the ring and pinion gear teeth. Plus, surface fatigue generally affects bearings at contact stress points. So this pitting is actually surface fatigue. Oh yeah, the cavities generally start small and then they grow larger. So what about the metal flaking off this gear here? That's another form of surface fatigue, spalling. When the metal is severely stressed, small pieces of metal flake off. So both pitting and spalling are examples of surface fatigue. Right, and surface fatigue usually results from overloading. Now how do gear teeth get broken off like this? That's from repeated overloading. Now this kind of failure is called bending fatigue. The gear teeth are supposed to bend slightly, but these were repeatedly stressed beyond their bending limit. They bend, and then they bend until they finally crack. Huh? Yeah. Cracks indicate bending fatigue. The cracks progress across the gear teeth until it fails. I see. Well, now, how do these marks get on this gear here? Now, those are beach marks. Beach marks are like the rings of a tree. Each time an excessive load is applied, it leaves its mark. Now, what causes these star-shaped cracks here? That's torsional or twisting fatigue. When an axle shaft is overloaded, as you can see in this cross-section, cracks start on the surface of the shaft, then they progress inward. Finally, the shaft fractures entirely. <laughs> Catastrophic failure. In other words, the axle is completely non-functional. Well, there must be ways to avoid problems like these. Well, the thing you've got to remember is that these fatigue failures were caused by repeatedly exceeding the axle's load limitations. And failures like these can be prevented. Right. You can avoid overload failures if the vehicle is used for the specific job it was designed to perform. Now, what factors have to be considered? To avoid axle failures related to overload, keep these points in mind. Vehicle capabilities, gross axle weight rating, gross vehicle weight or gross combination weight and consider the road surface conditions. All these factors affect vehicle service life. Now earlier you mentioned incorrect vehicle operation as another major cause of axle failure. That's right. Incorrect driving techniques are the second major cause of axle failures. Incorrect operation can result in two serious failures. 
shock loading and spin out. Now, when you say incorrect vehicle operation, do you mean popping the clutch? Uh, that doesn't seem like such a big deal. Oh, yes. Popping the clutch is serious. It leads to shock loading, which means an excessive load is applied so rapidly that it shocks the system. Yes. The shock usually damages the ring and pinion gears, and sometimes the shafts or differential gears. So that's what's happened to this ring and pinion, huh? Right. Teeth missing or broken below the root line are classic shock load failures. The shock loading is caused by going from wet or slippery roads to dry pavement while your wheels are spinning. The dry pavement immediately slows the wheels down while the drivetrain is still applying full power to the axle. Something has to give. At very least, the differential gears crack, like this. Teeth are broken off 90 degrees apart, huh? Yes, so failure happens instantly. Well, not uh, compensating for poor traction can really damage the axle, huh? You bet. Another situation which requires smart driving is backing the rig under a trailer. If the landing gear is too low or if you back up too fast, the tractor slams into place while the engine is still applying power to the drivetrain. Hmm. I can see where a major shock like that would really fracture an axle shaft or a ring and pinion set. Definitely. Shock loads can damage the axle. Bob, if you can help me, let's move this away and we can make room for some more examples of failure. One. The second kind of failure related to incorrect operation is spin-out. You mean spinning your wheels when you lose traction? Well, not really. Spin-out refers to one wheel or a set of wheels spinning while the other is stationary. Because of poor traction, when you try to move the vehicle, the differential side gears and pinions spin extremely fast. Centrifugal force throws the lube out and away from the gear's teeth and cross shaft. And that creates excessive heat. So the oil film between the pinion gear and cross shaft bakes off. Huh? Right. Once the lube bakes off, the result is metal-to-metal -metal contact, which creates even more heat. Finally, Metal transfers from the pinions and the cross shaft, a failure known as galling. Well, I bet that's how this cross shaft and pinion got ruined, huh? Right. If a driver continues to operate the vehicle after galling has occurred, the pinion gear can be friction welded to the cross shaft. It sounds like it would be a good idea to use chains or get a tow. It'd be a whole lot cheaper than an axle repair, huh? Sure would. Unfortunately, a lot of drivers just don't realize the damage that spin-out causes. That's where effective driver training would make a difference, wouldn't it? It would make a difference. There's no reason to have shock loading or spin-out failures. When driver education includes a good understanding of axle operation, a lot of failures can be eliminated. Bob, up till now we've been discussing the problems that incorrect driving techniques can cause in the main differential. But with tandem axles, there's another consideration, the inner axle differential. Let's clear the table and bring out the uh, inner axle components, and I'll be able to explain it further. Okay. Bill, aren't inner axle differentials sometimes referred to as power dividers? That's right, Bob. The power divider is the differential that's located in the front axle of a tandem assembly. It's responsible for dividing power between the front and rear axles of the tandem through this shaft. Give it a turn. That's it. Now the inner axle differential is designed to help the two rear axle assemblies run at different speeds when necessary. Like when there's poor traction, huh? Well, poor traction is one of the reasons. Another is that the axles run at different speeds when the tire size varies between the front and rear axles. Or cornering can affect the axle speeds. I see. Now, when drivers follow the correct procedures for using the inner axle differential, they can eliminate spin-out and prevent the possibility of shock load. Now, are spin-out and shock load failures in the inner axle different from those in the main differential? No, they're similar. The inner axle operates the same way as the wheel differential, only it controls the speed between the two axle assemblies rather than between the wheels. Before, you said that spin-out in the main differential was caused when one set of wheels was stationary while the other was spinning because of poor traction. Right. That's a good explanation of spin-out in the main differential. In the inner axle differential, spin-out occurs when one of the rear axle assemblies is stationary and the other is spinning. 
You see. So the spinning creates high heat in the differential, huh? That's right, Bob. The gears are cooled by lube flowing through the differential. The inner axle differential is turning at drive shaft speed. So centrifugal forces cause the lube to go through the differential case too quickly. And if the gears aren't cooled by the lube, then there would be a spin-out failure, right? Exactly. Like galling. Or the pinion gears may friction weld to the cross shaft. Hmm. Just like you see in the main differential, huh? Now another major problem that arises when the interaxle isn't used properly is shock load. Well, that's related to poor traction too, isn't it? You bet. Shock load can result from poor traction, especially if the driver engages the inner axle lock while the axles are spinning at different speeds. Hmm, that doesn't sound too good. What failure does that cause? Well, several really, hmm. like this broken clutch collar, or the mating teeth could fracture. Oh, I see what you mean here. Now, here's another serious shock load failure. This broken shaft occurred when one axle had traction and the other one was spinning and then momentarily hit dry pavement. Well, it sounds like it's vital for drivers to understand how to use the interaxle lock correctly. Huh? Oh, you're right. In both cases, if the driver would have released the clutch, allowed both axles to stop or run at the same speed, and then engaged the interaxle lock, these costly failures would have been prevented. Now, are there any other failures related to interaxle differential? Ah, uh, just one. This one is related to improper maintenance. Hmm. The support bearing can fail as a result of lube contamination. Well, Bill, how does the lube get contaminated? Well, water or tiny metal particles get in the lube. In fact, I was just about to go into failures related to improper maintenance. Well, if we've covered all the interaxle differential failures, maybe we could clear off this table and get to our next subject, huh? Okay. Now, Bill, earlier you mentioned improper maintenance as a cause of axle failure. Now, is it simply a matter of checking the lube? Well, that's a big part of it. But you do have to check the oil seals and the gaskets for leaks. The main thing is to follow a regular maintenance schedule. Then you'll catch potential problems before they're serious. Hmm. Obviously, low oil levels would be a problem. Right. The gears heat up and there's insufficient lube to cool them down. So, are these gears here discolored as a result of high heat? Oh, yeah. These gears get so hot that they can actually melt. Now, take a look at these gear teeth. Hmm. Metal from the mating gear actually fused to the teeth. Sounds like it's crucial to keep the lube levels up. It's not just keeping the lube level up. You also have to be sure the lube is changed regularly. Otherwise, the additives could be depleted or broken down from age. Well, that makes sense. Sure. High heat breaks down the additives, causing premature gear failure, such as scuffing, like this. And once the lube breaks down, there's nothing to separate the teeth when they mesh. Well, these teeth are so worn that they can't possibly function properly. No, they can't. Depleted additives or improper lube causes an unusual wear pattern on the teeth. First, the gears are scored. Eventually, the metal-to-metal -metal contact between the gears hones down the teeth until they have a knife edge. Well, what kind of lube should be used to provide adequate protection? You need a multi-purpose, high-point gear lube with EP, extreme pressure additives. If you don't use the recommended lube, the gear teeth will score immediately. And checking the lube sounds easy, but how does it get overlooked? A lot of times they don't realize that there's a problem. For example, a driver may not know that water will contaminate the lube. They don't have the axle checked after driving through high water. If the axle's in water over the breather, the water will contaminate the lube. Is that the main way water gets in? Well, yeah, that's one way. Also, condensation can build up, especially if the vehicle has been sitting for a prolonged period of time. What effect does water have? Pitting is most common. You'll see some etching, too. But water isn't the only contaminant. Tiny metal particles from normal wear are carried throughout the differential along with the lube. So the particles act like a lapping compound. Exactly. Lube contaminated with metal particles causes frosting on the gears and bearings. And if the metal content is excessive, scoring will occur. 
Regular maintenance schedules would prevent these failures. Now, what all should be checked when a vehicle comes in? Well, you should check the lube level before draining it. Look for excessive metal particles on the plug. Since it's magnetic, they'll show up there. Some filings are normal, but a lot of particles or chunks of metal aren't. Check the lube for a burnt odor and inspect for leaking seals and gaskets. Now, what refill lube should be used? Well, like I was telling you before, high-point gear lube with extreme pressure additives. Anything less will cause the gears to score immediately. Okay, let's go back to review the failures we've talked about. Bill, from what we've gone over in the shop, we've been able to determine that axles fail as a result of misusing the axle or overloading it, incorrect driving techniques, and improper maintenance. In essence, a lack of education about axle function or failure to adhere to a maintenance schedule are responsible for most axle failures. To eliminate almost all heavy-duty axle failures, keep these points in mind. Operate within the vehicle design capabilities. Follow correct driving guidelines, especially when using the interaxle differential. And keep a regular preventive maintenance schedule. These precautions aren't expensive, and they pay you back in the long run. And compared to the cost of an axle repair and the money you lose when you take a vehicle out of service, seems the benefits are obvious. Axle failures are preventable. Right. Spicer System Training for the Competitive Edge.